American Military Engineers, um, New York City uh, Post. Um, I am Eric Backus, and I'm a part of the steering committee for this series. And today's topic, uh, as you see on the screen, is indeed uh, the science of storm surge risk reduction. Um, so with that said, it's time to kind of get into what we're doing here. And I want to first review a little bit how we got here before we get into the session today. So the first we had, we've had five sessions. Um, starting in January, we focused on risk reducing strategies for schools and post COVID-19. February, we followed that up with uh, thinking about the economic impact of sea level rise and storm surge in the tri-state region and the consequences of a no action scenario. In March, we had a session, a pair of sessions actually, one on national and international efforts to rethink codes in light of resilience, as well as another session on the New York City Resilience Code that was enacted after Superstar and Standing on an interim basis now made permanent. In April, we had a conversation with representatives from across New York State agencies and several academics discussing resilience rating systems and how they make better buildings and better communities. And then last month, we had a great conversation with two leaders in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the North Atlantic Division Commander, Brigadier General Tickner, and the New York District Commander, Colonel Lozado, who shared their thoughts about the future of military engineering. Um, for those that want to go back and see some of these other sessions, um, please feel free to go to the U.S. Green Building Council's YouTube channel. You will see on that channel, these are available for public viewing, so you can watch them anytime you want. Uh, I, I, I encourage you to stream them live every day of the week. It's, they're great stuff. I, I wouldn't go that far, uh, but, uh, you know, take advantage of that. Um, but this really, really brings us to today's session in thinking about where we're crescendoing on the science of storm surge reduction. And today's discussion will be around the world of outer harbor gates as in place in other countries and here in the United States and what a similar situation could look like in New York Harbor. Um, what we're going to do is share uh, later, the other thing that I should let you know is later this year in, in the fall, on October 6th, we'll be bringing all these sessions back together in a, in a way to engage more parties and talk about reactions and updates from what we talked about through this series through June um, and finding a way to bounce forward, to bounce into the next next parts of resilience and continue this conversation. So be look on the lookout for that. We'll give you a little more information here at the end of today's session. So now with all those uh, not so paid advertisements kind of out of the way, I wanna thank you and recognize the entire team that's helped pull together this uh, series over the last several months. Namely, Ms. Uh, Suzanne Ger D. Geronimo, who's uh, with us and actually on a panel tonight, today, excuse me. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel retired Joe Por Porobecchio, Lieutenant Colonel Ben Wallen from the US Military Academy at West Point, Lieutenant Colonel retired Joe Manis, Mr. Michael Scarano, Ms. Sarah Chihuahua, um, Ms. Medea Vietleri and Mr. Gautam uh, Trafalgar, who have all been a part of the steering committee. So thank you all for what you're we're doing. As you're seeing here, um, as we strike through are the several slides that are for um, what you can get for in terms of uh, credentials uh, and in credential maintenance. Um, this is obviously, as you see, an AIA registered uh, uh, continuing education unit course. You can continue to the next slide. Um, and uh, provided and certified through U.S. Green Building Council. You can also get uh, professional development hours, 1.5 professional development hours for all you engineers out there through New York State uh, is certified that way. And it's also 1.5 uh, hours for, of course, all things, the GBCI for your accreditations for lead accreditation. So if you're interested in that, please uh, make sure you've gotten that information. Medea, you should have done it during registration. Let us know your applicable numbers. If you haven't, uh, please uh, make sure you get that information to Medea or, or so on. You can let us know in the chat and we'll get you contacts of uh, how to do that. Um, so next, go to the next slide, please. Um, this is a general course description. We'll go to the next slide, please. And here's our learning objectives today. These are really important because as you know, uh, if you've done a, a PDH session, there's always an opportunity to uh, have a little quiz at the end. And so be looking forward to that. But I also want to remind you is that this is Zoom. And if you haven't been on Zoom before, which I think is very hard at this point and across the world, but if you haven't, there's this wonderful thing called chat. And there's another wonderful thing called Q&A. We encourage you during the presentation today be, uh, for our great speakers to put in some questions so that we have an opportunity for them to respond to your particular inquiries as we go through this session today. Put it in the chat, put it in the Q&A. Uh, we'll be glad to answer those questions at the end. So you'll see me at the back end. For now though, um, if you go to the next slide, please, I'm gonna turn this over to um, Malcolm who will let us know what's going on with uh, the next part of this. So Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, my name is Malcolm Bowman. I'm a physical oceanographer at the State University of New York at Stony Brook on Long Island. 
I've uh, been studying the, <clears throat> the oceanography of New York's, New Jersey's coastal waters now for a long time. Um, and we're part of a team of professionals called the, the New York, New Jersey Metropolitan Storm Surge Working Group. So we represent a wide um, range of, of professions from science from, to engineering, architecture, uh, urban planning, and other disciplines. Um, and this, our story goes back really to Hurricane Katrina that devastated New Orleans in 2005. And <clears throat> that led to uh, tremendous damage and almost 2000 loss of life. Following, following Katrina, uh, the Army Corps got very busy very quickly. And now the city is protected by a series of storm surge barriers, levees and so forth. Following Katrina, I wrote, a, I wrote an editorial for the New York Times and it was called A City at Sea. And it was, it, it was apparent to me that the low lying topography of this global city, a few feet above sea level, represented a clear and present danger. And so the, the editorial I wrote says, I predicted that New York City would get flooded. And it was not a question of if, but when. And so when was the when? Well, it was actually seven years after that, but in 2009, I, I'm sorry, I haven't introduced my, the other speakers. I should maybe just back up a little bit. Um, on a screen we have just from top to bottom, Jonathan Goldstick, who's a senior marine engineer with Langan Engineering in Manhattan. Uh, Suzanne Di Geronimo, uh, an architect of Di Geronimo Architects Incorporated in New Jersey. Hamish Bowman, uh, also in New Zealand right now, about 400 miles south of me. Uh, Hamish is a also an oceanographer, ocean modeler, a glaciologist, an Antarctic, Antarctic researcher. Um, then we have uh, Keith Roberts. Keith is, um, is also a ocean modeler, oceanographer, presently at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, South America. Dan Gutman is an engineer, scientist, um, an urban planner, and a activist in the New York City region. Have I left anybody out? I don't think so. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we're going to be, so the story, we pick up the story now in 2009 when I helped organize a conference at the Brooklyn Polytech, now known as the Tandon School of Engineering of NYU. And at that conference, um, the organizers, Douglas Hill and myself, we invited representatives of five major engineering firms, several from New York City, others uh, from the Netherlands and other places. And we gave each team an assignment. We said, look, we want to study what we call storm surge barriers. And we're going to give you a geographical location. And we want you to come up with some conceptual ideas of how your company might design uh, suitable storm surge barriers that would significantly reduce the risk of a damage, future damage to New York City. So it was a very interesting conference. Um, Jonathan was one of the participants. He'll tell you about that. Um, <clears throat> there was some delay like there often is in publishing the proceedings. Um, and it turned out that the, 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 the ASC, American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, published the book and it came out actually about one or two weeks before the Sandy hit in October uh, 2012 with devastating results. So it was very apropos and this has led us to form the group that we're part of today, the, the uh, Metro Storm Surge Working Group. This is, our, um, this is our vision, this is our statement that we are all volunteer stakeholders. We're really a think tank more rather than an organization. And the premise that we work under is that the protection of the greater metropolitan region, and by that I mean New York City, New Jersey, Western Connecticut and Long Island, <clears throat> the protection of the greater metro region against catastrophic flooding from ocean storm surges, climate change and rising sea levels can best be secured by a regional approach that transcends geographic and political boundaries. And that's very important because 
as we'll see that the, the piecemeal approach that's, that's been followed to date just ha hasn't worked. This uh, slide here shows uh, the match, the scale of the threat, <coughs> excuse me. Superstorm Sandy was the largest storm ever recorded by the National Weather Service. By largest, I mean the largest diameter, almost 1100 miles across from east to west. It did not have the strongest winds. And as we all know, it uh, came up the east coast from its source in the Caribbean and took a sharp turn to the left And when it hit the beaches of northern New Jersey on the night of October 29th, 2012. The little inset show, <clears throat> shows you what we're going to be talking about today, the region where that we have uh, proposed these barriers. And you can see starting from the top, there's one, one called the East River Seagate. And then at the bottom left, the Ocean Harbor Gateway. And then we have two more, the East Rockway and the Jones Inlets. Um, there would be more further east off the picture. We're not going to talk about those today. <clears throat> So you can see that this was a giant storm. Now associated with storm surges is, is, uh, uh, is another <clears throat> a consequence of climate change and that's called rising sea level. They're two different phenomena, but they're both related to climate change. Storm surges are a, are a sudden uh, attack, maybe unexpected. On human terms, you might think of it as a heart attack, requires instant attention in a hospital for life-saving. Sea level rise is like a chronic disease that lasts for many, many years and it just gets worse with time. We do what we can to live for as long as we can in a healthy state. So there's a lot of discussion, a lot of research going on, a lot of uncertainty as actually what will be the rate of sea level rise over the next 100 years, well, in this case, 2100. And these are three scenarios that the Army Corps of Engineers uses, these predictions. And they're based on three, these three curves represent three, um, three scenarios of how civilization, human civilization is going to cut back on burning fossil fuels. And so the top graph will, is Business, what we, what's called as business as usual. If no changes is made to our everlasting growth and reliance on fossil fuels and the release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, that will accelerate the melting of land ice, say in Greenland, glaciers around the world, and Antarctica. And so this graph suggests that by 2100, sea level could be five feet higher than it, than it is now. If however, the nations of the world uh, take this seriously and make uh, a strong effort, it's possible that we could end up with a slower rise of sea level like the middle one. And the orange, the orange bottom curve is, is a sort of the best possible uh, coordination internationally that would lead to a much more livable world. So the question is, where are we heading right now? Well, it turns out, unfortunately, and you can see that little wiggly yellow line on the left of the graph, is that we're actually still climbing that worst case scenario. And as we know, the G7, uh, seven wealthiest nations uh, met in Europe and England just uh, a few days ago. And it's, it's pleasing to see that those nations are taking it seriously, but of course, it's a very complicated problem. Next slide. Now this shows how the two things kind of interplay, how storm surge becomes more serious as sea level rises. So the, the top graph is a little cartoon, which shows a storm surge, very large waves, elevated sea level with the, the strong winds pushing the water against the coast, hitting a house. There's, there's a, there's a green, green council house there. And that's the damage. Now, 2050, Sea level has risen by a certain amount, this, and the same storm surge height and intensity is doing a lot more damage because the base level of the oceans has come up. And then by 2100, you can see that the damage increases. So, so the problem is not going to get better, it's going to get worse as time goes by. Next slide, please. Now following, uh, following Sandy, 
In 2012, Mayor Bloomberg had 18 months left in office as mayor of New York City, so he decided that there was no time to waste if he was going to have an impact. There was, so he did not want to interact with the governor of New York State. They didn't get along to start with. He didn't want to deal with the governor of New Jersey, Chris Christie. He didn't want to deal with, this, with the feds either. So he put the New York City workforce he focused in a very um, strong way. It's very impressive. And they created this 450-page this, uh, book called New York City SIRR, Strategic Initiative for Rebuilding and Redesign, or rebuilding like that. And there was a whole catalog of piecemeal projects around the city, how they could strengthen the resilience of the city. And a bit later, the Army Corps got involved with, with a project called HATS, the Harbor and Tributary Study. And they, they focused on a variety of uh, measures, regional now, because being a federal agency, they included New Jersey. And we'll hear all about that. So these two studies were quite independent of, of each other, although they did interact to some effect. New York State and New Jersey State chipped in a very tiny amount of money to the Army Corps as partners. New York City was a third partner, but they contributed zero dollars, but still had a place at the table. Next slide. This just, this just shows um, what, the, what the bathymetry, the coastline of New York City looked like in about the late 1700s. That's a British survey, 1779. And, and the right, right panel is the harbor pretty much as it is now. So when people say, hey, you guys, you're talking about modifying the properties of the harbor and getting away from its natural state. Well, its natural state is not what it was two or 300 years ago. So it is in a continual state of modification. So we, we really rebuff that argument that we're tink tinkering with uh, nature, as it were. Next slide. This graph shows what we call the circle of protection and our thesis is this. If, we, if these barriers that we're talking about today were built, the red arrows show where they would be, that, that had they been in place the night that Superstorm Sandy hit the region, there would have been zero damage inside that circle. Now that's a bold statement to make, but we believe that's true. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a mission that we're on that we, we've been pushing for quite a few years now, and it's controversial, it's expensive, it's going to take many years, but we think it's the, it's the way to go. Next slide. Now, what did actually Sandy actually look like? These, these are observations. These, this is not, not a theory. At two tide gauges, the famous one at the Battery, the southern tip of Manhattan, and the second one in Kings Point, Long Island, in, in the western... Long Island Sound, where it connects to the East River near the Frog's Neck Bridge. So the blue lines are what we call the astronomical tides. That's the tide you get in good weather. It's due to the combined <clears throat> gravitational pull of the moon and the sun. It's a sinusoidal wave with a high tide every 25 hours. The green line is the actual observed sea level, water level, at those tide stations due to the effects of Superstorm Sandy. If you look at the top graph, the battery, you can see the peak there, it's hard for me to read, but 12 feet above mean sea level. And look, it happened at exactly at the normal astronomical high tide. So the surge and the high tide were on, on each other. And also that night, the moon was full. It was a, what we call a spring tide. So that all combined to give that enormous tide that created all that damage. But if you look at the Western Long Island Sound, the lower panel, it has a different shape. It has a double peak. And that's because the maximum surge did not occur at high tide, but it occurred a bit later. And the tide was dropping rapidly at Kings Point. So the damage was not as bad as it might have been in Western Long Island Sound. Next slide. These are some calculations that, and some graphics that uh, Hamish has done. It's based on two things. One, very accurate topography. The orange colors are land. You can see Brooklyn there. 
um, Breezy Point, which is the, the, the western tip of the far Rockaways, Jamaica Bay and the Rockaway Peninsula itself. And the blue, the blue line is the maximum water level that happened at the peak of Sandy. And you can see this graph shows very clearly the, that how much land was inundated, especially uh, southern Brooklyn, but also the, the Rockaways very badly damaged. Next slide. This is the same, um, a beautiful map. This is just uh, what's called the Two Rivers region, just south of Sandy Hook. And you can see that whole region and most of the barrier beach itself was flooded at the peak of the surge. So combining our computer models and observation, accurate observations using LIDAR, which is a form of airborne radar, radar altimetry, we can learn uh, very accurately what happened that night. Next slide. Now, without discussing what yet what the barriers might look like, where they might go, this, this is a sch schematic diagram that shows how they would be operated. And we think where, where that the Outer Harbor Gateway is uh, between uh, Sandy Hook, New Jersey and Breezy Point Rockaways, the solid line, the wiggly line, that is the tide, tide level during this, uh, the Sandy event that we've already seen. And the other very light gray lines, they represent tidal currents through that region that approaches to New York Harbor as time went by or would go, would go by. So the, the way this would work, these barriers would work is that given accurate weather forecast and storm surge predictions, which we can do now with about a three day time horizon, you would close these gates and, and others with Jonathan will talk about that at local low tide. See where the red arrow is on the left. And when the currents, tidal currents were weakest, the gates are shut and they're kept shut for about 36 hours until the storm has passed. And you see that's the right hand red arrow. And so what would be, the sea level would be kept low within, inside the barriers, which would be that circle of protection we talked about earlier. And it's important to remember that the Hudson River is a very flat river. It only, it only rises about 18 inches between the ocean and Troy up there, Albany. So it can store a huge amount of rainfall within the barriers. It can store a lot of sewage discharges without building up sea level before. So that's basically the length of time these barriers would be needed to be closed for a sandy type event. Next slide. And now I'll hand the, uh, the microphone over to Jonathan. Thank you, Malcolm. I, uh... We've been talking about barriers in an abstract kind of way, and we find that many people don't know what they might look like. So this is sort of a, a worldwide tour of different kinds of barriers. Um, one thing that's, that's interesting is how long barriers have been around. If you take a look at the first barriers in the Netherlands, uh, they're in the, the late 50s. First barriers in the US are in the late 1960s. So barriers have been around for a while. They've been working very well for a long time. They're spread out pretty well throughout the world. Uh, in the next slides, I'll talk about some different types, show some examples. These are three examples in England. The center one is the, the Thames Barrier in London, 1,700 feet long, uh, with four openings, four 200-foot wide openings. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Just some example of barriers in the left and right, to the Tees Barrage in England, the Hull Impoundment in England. Uh, the Hull Impoundment on the right is a, uh, called a drop gate or a lift gate. Uh, and you can see that the, the width of those channels is controlled by the width that, that you can span with the gate itself. The one on the left here is the St. Petersburg barrier. Uh, you're actually not seeing too much of the movable bits of it. And much of the St. Petersburg barrier, which is 16 miles long, is really a, a rubble mound structure, like, like a, a rock breakwater that has a highway going over it. Uh, and at the points where the, where the shift traffic is and the barriers open and close, the highway uh, goes underneath as a tunnel. The one in the center is the New Bedford Harbor barrier. And uh, the most recent one on the right is the Intercoastal Waterway. Just a, a portion of the barrier system was built after Katrina. 
These are examples of uh, lift gates or drop gates. Um, the one on the on the upper right, uh, you saw a nighttime for trouble already. Uh, that that's a, a gate that's normally in the the open position and can drop to closed. Uh, the one on the uh, left as well, drop gate uh, in the Netherlands that lowers into the closed position. And you can see uh, one on the lower right that's being raised from the bottom to stop the flow of water. These are the promised, uh, this is the promised slide of the Thames barrier. Uh, you can see in the center slide, the way that barrier works, it, is, it has these semicircular plates, very, very large plates the, that in the normally open position are lying in that cradle on the bottom horizontally. When it's time to open the barrier, it rotates into the up position, which you can see in the right and, uh, and closes off the flow of water. This is a rather unusual kind called a flat gate. The, uh, this is uh, being completed now in Venice. Um, they use uh, a flat gate to protect Venice from very frequent flooding, including tidal flooding. Uh, these are gates that normally sit on the bottom and just rotate about a hinge to the closed position. The one on the left is operated by compressed air. The water is pumped out of the, uh, the buoyant barrier, which then rises. The one on the right is hydraulically operated. And all these barriers have their own advantages and disadvantages. One tricky thing about the flat gates is as they sit on the bottom, sediment tends to accumulate on top of them. So they need to be cleaned or exercised often. The one on the left here is a miter gate, what I call the saloon door gate. Those have been used for centuries now on locks all over the country and around the world. Um, they just, uh, flap and, and meet each other in the middle. These tend to be for, for very narrow structures, uh, usually in locks. One on the right is just a diagram of the sector gate. Those tend to be the largest ones in the world, and I'll show some examples of those. This is uh, one of the movable, one half of the movable gate of the St. Petersburg barrier. It normally lives upland. This is uh, while it's under construction. It normally lives upland and is driven out by very, very large motors. Uh, and in, in one case, uh, the backup of those motors is actually a train locomotive in case the motor fails. Uh, the barrier is uh, pushed out. Uh, it's somewhat buoyant. After it's pushed out, it's flooded and it, it um, settles on, a, on the bottom to stop the flow of water. The lower right picture is intended to show you that a gap remains. When these, when these close, they don't close uh, with switch watch precision. Uh, if you can see the men standing on the gate, you can get an idea of the size of it. Um, it's okay to have that gap in the middle. There's an awful lot of water that needs to come in to flood St. Petersburg or New York Harbor or Holland. It's okay if they don't seal tightly. In this picture of the Maestland barrier in Holland, you can see again that there's water escaping between where the gates nominally meet. And that's okay. This is one of the bigger ones in the world. This is an animation I was describing before. A gate opens, it floods the, where the barrier is so it can float and be pushed out. They are then flooded and sit on the bottom. See these gates open, the water enters the chamber, that becomes buoyant, driven out, flooded and drops to the bottom. And that is it for, for your tour of floodgates around the world. And I'm going to turn it over to Keith. We'll turn it over to Hamish to talk about some of the high resolution modeling we've done. Thanks, John. So I'm going to continue on where, uh, where, Mal where Malcolm and John left off, talking a little bit about some of the high resolution modeling approaches and how we're actually simulating the effects of barriers and the, and the design of various barrier designs and the design of various barriers along the New York area. And so next slide. So uh, this is kind of an abstract idea here. We, we need to simulate the processes that represent tides that, and that control tides and storm surge that Malcolm talked about. And we need to simulate these large hurricane uh, wind fields and pressure fields in order that drive these storm surges. And so in order to do that, we need to develop these computer models and uh, basically the, the kind of standard, golden standard type of approach to do that is using uh, unstructured mesh-based 
uh, model. And so what you're looking at right here is basically a mesh and a mesh is a, essentially um, a collection of triangles. And I, we're gonna zoom in in a couple of slides here, but basically this mesh represents your computational domain. And so in the area of interest, we're gonna put very, very fine resolution. So if you go to the next slide. So as we go into the areas of interest, we refine uh, the, the size of the triangles in this slide, you can really see the different details appearing. And in order to, so what we do is we represent uh, what are called partial differential equations. You may remember those from your calculus class. Uh, basically these equations can be used to model physical processes that govern the motion of the water in the ocean. And in order to solve those equations, we need a, uh, a tool to do that. And, and the tool that we've been using in this particular approach is called the ADCIRC model. ADCIRC model is a program and it basically it takes as input this computational mesh and then it solves the governing equations and it, and it can give you predictions of water levels and free surface currents and stuff like that that's relevant if you're interested in building different barrier designs in various parts of the world. So what you're looking at is we had to create this mesh. There is not, you know, you have to build this yourself and that's a very complicated process. And obviously you need to resolve all the critical pathways of water. So if we go to the next slide, uh, you can see as we go zoom into the, the area of interest, which uh, our storm surge working group has really been focused on here, we can see that we have incredibly small triangles down to around 10 meters, 30 feet in size, which you might say, oh, that's not, you know, that's not too small, but actually for this kind of application, it is. And the computational process, the cost of doing this kind of simulation scales with the number of triangles that you have in your domain. So you really want to scale back the uh, amount of triangles so that you can conserve on computational resources and at the same time resolve the critical features that control the pathway of water. For example, if you're modeling a river, you need to make sure that it's correctly represented in your computer model. Otherwise, the simulations are going to be wrong, right? And so this kind of approach, you may wonder, oh, we're going from all the way into the deep ocean to the near shore. And the reason for that is that these hurricanes that we're modeling, for example, as Malcolm pointed out, Hurricane Sandy had hundreds and hundreds of miles of wind fields that were contributing to the, the motion of water along the shoreline of, of Long Island, New York, and the, the neighboring areas. So it's really important that we have these big models, but like I said, with this kind of unstructured mesh-based approach where we're scaling the element size as we get closer to the shore, we can really conserve on computational resources, making it a viable approach uh, that, that we can use to explore the effect of barriers. So uh, if you go to the next slide, I just wanna show the next slide, please. Yeah, so the, the fact is we're, as we're using very high accurate uh, topography and bathymetry data on the model. So if you go back, please. So in order to model this, we need to represent the coastline using very highly accurate topography and bathymetry data. And so we're representing not only underwater regions, but also over land. So as, as a flood occurs, right, you have water moving over land to normally dried areas. And so this process can be actually modeled using this kind of unstructured mesh-based uh, approach. And so what I'm showing you here, this is the, the colors indicate the topography of uh, the elevation uh, on the mesh. And so this data is obtained from real geophysical data sets like LIDAR data and other uh, publicly available data sets. And we use that and put it on the model. It has a big effect on the accuracy of the simulation. Okay, next slide. So in order to represent barriers, we need a, we need a, a way to do that. And in this unstructured mesh-based approach, we actually represent them as something called weirs. And a weir is essentially a, uh, it's a, like a levee, if you're familiar with uh, what is in Mississippi and Louisiana area. It's basically a static wall that doesn't move right in time. It's just there all the time. And so in order to get uh, kind of a, a macro picture of what happens when, for example, if we put this regional storm surge barrier between Breezy Point and Sandy Hook and what the effect would be on the circulation of the coastal waters, we have to put the barrier in place. We do a simulation with the barrier in there. And so the water obviously doesn't pass. 
right? It's sufficiently high so that it doesn't pass in this theoretical simulation. Then we look at what changes on the simulation result. So we do a simulation with and without it. And then uh, keeping everything else the same, we can get a kind of a, a perspective of how much water is actually, uh, how much you know, flooding is saved, what areas maybe get more flooding or what areas get lesser flooding, how does it change the circulation of water? And so with this kind of approach, we can, we can have like a playground to explore different barrier designs in, in the area. So this green line just represents that weird uh, kind of approach. So if you go to the next slide, the other barrier design that we actually explored was, I think there's a bit of a lag. The, in the, the Long Island Sound, this is the Long Island Sound here going into the East River. We see this red line here, it represents another barrier. And so this is very different from what Jonathan was showing. We're just representing these barriers kind of as lines. And the line represents a gap inside the mesh so water cannot pass. So at first principle, it acts as a very simplistic barrier system, but it gives us a really good idea of how the coastal ocean circulation is gonna change if there is a barrier there throughout the duration of a very significant event. And in the case of the New York City area, it's actually really complicated because the tides, for example, in the Long Island Sound actually are out of phase with the tides in the South in the, in the New York Harbor. So in order to close the barrier, you, you know, you have to have both barriers in New York Harbor and Long Island Sound. You can't just close off one and not the other if you were gonna do this kind of approach to really get full protection. And so that kind of aspect comes into play, uh, but we, uh, we haven't really explored that to great detail yet, but there is a timing issue as well that you have to consider when you're doing this kind of modeling approach, because you don't want to close the barriers at the wrong time, uh, or for example, just close one and not close the other. So th there's actually very interesting consequences to, to this kind of simulations. Next slide. This is just a zoom in. You can see that uh, of, of the barrier in the Long Island Sound here, this, these are very narrow pathways of the water to flow through. So yeah, from a, a coastal engineering standpoint, it's, it's gonna be very complicated to build a barrier. So that's one factor that comes into play is where do we put the barrier? You know, you have to think about what the cost is gonna be and um, how hard is it gonna be to maintain and, and basically keep up. It's, if it's going to be in a place that requires, for example, underwater maintenance, good luck. You know, so you have to be careful with that. So we're actually taking that into consideration with these theoretical barrier design simulations as well. Next slide. And uh, this is the final slide I'm going to talk before I pass it to Hamish here. Basically, what this is showing is if we built that regional storm surge barrier between Sandy Hook and Breezy Point, what, what would be the difference in the free surface elevation, the total water level action, not the free surface, between with the barrier and without the barrier. And so this is contours in inches. And so you can see that there is a slight increase, this blue color denotes an increase along the front face of the barrier, but it's only on the order of a couple inches. Meanwhile, the area behind the barrier experiences very little to no change in the total water surface elevation. So a lot of people, when you present this barrier design, they expect that the water will bunch up along the, the front face of the barrier, act as if you were in a bathtub and flood the neighboring areas. And so with this kind of modeling approach, we can actually address those questions quantitatively and using physics. And so that's very important to get, get out to the public that we're not just guessing, there's actually these, these kind of modeling approaches that we can use to explore these designs. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Hamish and he's gonna continue showing some more modeling results that we've been exploring. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. No problem. So here's a uh, just animation of this model in action. And this shows uh, the outer inner New York uh, Harbor. And we can see, uh, if you look closely, it's a bit small to make out, but there's a little red line up at that uh, frog's neck barrier of on the northern shore of Long Island. And uh, it opens and closes at a different time than the Seagate down between uh, Sandy Hook, New Jersey and Breezy Point, New York. And uh, 
Yes, yeah, so we can look at very high detail in these uh, each little estuary in the in, and coming out of the river, and also in sort of in real time in the model, uh, look at where the flooding will be. Uh, you continue to the next slide, please. And that last one, of course, was with the uh, gates in operation. So here's uh, three different scenarios, or three different proposals of where a Seagate could be uh, for Western Long Island Sound. So you'll see Manhattan is just in the bottom left. And uh, the three proposed ones here are between the Whitestone and Frog's Next Bridge, and then connecting to City Island, and then connecting from Glen Cove on the far right. Now, sort of, you might say the further east you put it, in this case, the more communities in the Bronx and Western Long Island that would be protected. Although, in this case, it's uh, the further east you go, the larger amount of structure you need to build at greater expense. And in which case, it might just be considered too expensive and never get built. So maybe you, you know, compromise and put it somewhere where it's easier to build, but less houses are protected, less humans are protected. And uh, Daniel is next. We'll talk a bit more about that sort of thing. Now, if we go on to the next slide, please. So here's just a, a so this is from US Army Corps' Hat Study, what are their proposed locations? And we can see at this point, uh, if you look very closely, these little numbers, that it's about 40 feet deep here. And sort of this is the narrowest place you could put it, which is exactly why they put the big infrastructure, the big bridges there, because it's the easiest place to cross the waterway. So, but with these models, we can very quickly and very rapidly sort of swap around where these gates would be, when they'd be, be closed, and uh, get a good look of what would happen under each one of these sort of cost benefit uh, scenarios. So next slide, please. So here's a picture again of uh, the Frog's Neck Seagate with uh, Manhattan in the bottom left again and Western Long Island Sound in the color in the right. And similar to what Keith was saying before, uh, you know, we're concerned with sort of the impacts of the, what the Seagates would have on the local communities and how much nearby flooding there would be. So in this case, because this is Hurricane Sandy, but because Hurricane Sandy hit closer to uh, low tide, we, another thing we can do in the model is we can move when the wind, we can move when the winds hit, when the landfall occurred. And so try to simulate sort of what a worst case scenario for this area for Sandy if it had taught me, it would just be a little different, would be like. And again, we only see a few extra inches of flooding, which is uh, not a good thing for the people nearby. But maybe if there's not, you know, billions of dollars of flooding to the west of that, there'd be more resources available to help with that extra little bit of flooding that does occur. Uh, next slide, please. So besides modeling, take, taking the weather models from NOAA and whatnot, and modeling the uh, tidal currents and the near shore flooding, we can also model the uh, wave heights. Now, the direct impact of the wave heights crashing onto the beach, if it's flooding over a beach, a place like Breezy Point, large waves can come in and literally knock the houses off their foundation and put them up the street, as uh, we saw. So, NOAA maintains a number of offshore wind buoys measuring. Uh, not just wave heights, but also wind speeds and sunlight and all sorts of things. Uh, so this red arrow is just pointing at one 44025, which is about 30 miles south Islip, New York. And so the plot on the right is comparing the observed wave heights seen at that buoy, Hurricane Sandy, with what our model is. So our model is tied in, coupled with the AdSurf model Keith was talking about, but it's called the Swan Wave model. And in this case, we can see it has matched very well. And in the case of these models, that's extremely well. So this gives us confidence uh, that in other places in our model that the waves were also doing well. Uh, onto the next slide, please. So here we see a picture over the entire model domain of what the maximum significant wave height was during Hurricane Sandy. 
So we can see most of the large waves up to, uh, to 57 feet out in the Atlantic uh, happen far offshore. But if we zoom in, so next slide, please. We can sort of get an idea of what the wave exposure will be along the beaches in the local and the coastal communities. And we can do this with and without the uh, Seagate barriers in place. So in this image, it's uh, they're turned on, or the gates, the gates closed, I should say. And you still get a bit of waves, like maybe six, seven feet of waves inside inner New York Harbor, just from the local winds. And you can sort of sort of tracks the deep water where the dredge shipping channels are in a way. Uh, but most of the most of the inner harbors, not just protected from the flooding uh, storm surge and the hurricane, but also from the battering ram effect of the waves. Next slide, thanks. And with that, I'll pass over to Daniel. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh... Now we're going to talk about the studies that are, have been done and are being done. Uh, next slide. Um, the Corps of Engineers is doing the major study on uh, storm surge barriers. Uh, and they have five alternatives, which range from the regional offshore barriers uh, we've been discussing to um, uh, smaller, medium-sized barriers combined with uh, onshore barriers and uh, down to uh, just shoreline barriers alone with no uh, storm, surge, uh, storm surge barriers at all. Um, and there are five alternatives. Um, and the degree, but the degree of risk reduction in the, in, the way they, in the way they've designed these alternatives, the degree of risk reduction varies from more than 75% risk reduction from a storm uh, to less than 5% risk reduction. And so uh, it's very difficult in the way they've done this for, to compare uh, alternatives. Uh, and that's because they, they don't have a common uh, uh, objective of uh, protecting the entire region. Uh, next slide. And so here, these are the, uh, the alternatives that the core uh, was considering in their in their study. Uh, alternative two on the left is the one we've been discussing uh, with a, a regional barrier between Sandy Hook and uh, Breezy Point and another barrier uh, at in Throgs Neck. And that system uh, protects about 95% uh, of the region and reduces the risk by about 95%. And uh, that's the reason why we favor it. Uh, th then there's a second uh, alternative that is also regional in, in, in which instead of the uh, barrier between Sandy Hook and Breezy Point, uh, there's a barrier uh, at the Verrazano Bridge. Uh, and then two subsidiary barriers, one at Jamaica Bay and one at uh, Arthur Kill that uh, protects most, you know, most of the New, Jer uh, New Jersey risk. And that protects about 78%, reduces the risk by about 78%. All right, next slide. All right, and then there are these two middle alternatives uh, that don't have uh, the regional barriers uh, blocking uh, the flow into the uh, harbor, uh, either from the south or uh, from uh, Long Island Sound. Um, and instead, uh, these two alternatives have New York City's plan, which Malcolm mentioned, uh, which is ba which was based on, on, on shoreline barriers uh, around the most vulnerable parts of, uh, of New York City. Uh, and alternative 3B uh, on the left, uh, continues to have a, a barrier protecting most of New Jersey uh, at the bottom of Arthur Kill. And then because there's no uh, barrier on the Hudson River, it has another barrier at, at uh, Kill Van Cull. Uh, but it doesn't protect, for example, uh, except for Jersey City, it, do, it doesn't protect any um, other 
uh, shoreline community uh, on the Hudson River in New Jersey. And uh, the uh, alternative four on the right uh, has the same uh, uh, protection in New York that is based on the city's plan and, and somewhat less protection in New Jersey. And those two alternatives uh, protect either 40 or 60 percent uh, or reduce the risk of uh, flooding by 40 or 60 percent. Now, one of the reasons that uh, that there are so few of these shoreline barriers protecting New York is that the Corps uh, removed a, a large number of them. Uh, the city actually, the city's plan actually contains a large number of shoreline barriers, but the Corps removed them on the basis of their cost benefit analysis, a traditional cost benefit analysis, where they looked at each of these segments separately and then decided that some of them, uh, the, the, uh, the costs outweighed the benefits and simply removed, removed them from the picture. Um, and then there's a, the, uh, the fifth alternative uh, has none of the storm surge barriers, not even the one along uh, uh, Jamaica Bay and not, none in New Jersey and only a few shoreline barriers. And that's the one that reduces risk by only 5%. And we're not showing that one. Uh, next slide. So the, the, the problem with the core study, the main problem as we see it is the way they've done their analysis, at, which lead, led them to this wide uh, uh, range of, of risk reduction. And that, and that happened because they were basing their benefits uh, only on uh, of the four possible categories of benefits, uh, environmental benefits, social benefits, uh, regional economic benefits, and national economic benefits. Uh, the way the Corps has been doing their analysis focuses only on the national economic benefits. And in that category, that's the blue part on the uh, diagram, in that category, they essentially are, are, are uh, choosing their benefits only based on the, uh, the, the, uh, the value of uh, the structures and contents that are uh, uh, structure and the contents in the structures that are protected. And, um, and so they miss, they've been missing most of the benefits of, of any of these alternatives. Um, And in fact, the core study uh, uh, stopped at the uh, at about a year ago, or a little more than a year ago, uh, because they ran out of money. And that, and 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 and, uh, and then in uh, December, a new uh, Water Resources Development Act was passed in Congress, uh, which instructed them to start, restart the study. But, but now they will be, will be doing it in a different way. And the, uh, the, the way they, have, they analyze benefits and the way they choose alternatives uh, is going to be done differently because of this new uh, law that was approved in December. And uh, the core, and this will be new for the core and they've gonna, they will have to uh, revise all their guidance uh, uh, to, to comply with the congressional mandate uh, but they will now have to uh, in, uh, assess benefits in all four categories, and uh, and as well as uh, change the uh, the um, purpose of the study to not only consider uh, measures to uh, address storm surge, but also to address uh, to consider measures to address uh, sea level rise and and high precipitation events which are also consequences of uh, climate change. And, uh, and then as well, they will, the core will be required to, uh, I think they'll have to, um, uh, you know, um, uh, reconsider the, their, their, all these alternatives because uh, they're gonna have to include at least one alternative 
that doesn't include any barriers. And that, that, that means uh, things like zoning, uh, raising buildings, uh, retreating a little bit from uh, certain vulnerable areas of the, uh, of the shoreline. And they also uh, uh, can include plans that state and local entities could implement on their own, such as the entire New York City plan, a lot of which they had previously omitted. So I think the study uh, will continue, but it will continue hopefully in a, in a better uh, a better way uh, that's more sensitive to uh, concerns outside the, uh, the Corps' uh, uh, regulations as they've existed up to this point. Uh, and now uh, we'll turn the uh, mic over to, uh, well, to Jonathan. Uh, we'll talk about the onshore barriers. All right, thank you, Dan. Uh, we've been talking about offshore barriers, we've been talking about onshore barriers, and uh, many people and organizations, particularly the core, have been treating them as if they're the same thing, meaning they're equally easy to deploy and equally effective. So I, I want to go through some of the issues that I've run into on the projects I've been on looking at onshore barriers. First one has to do with timing. Um, if you have an offshore barrier, like the outer harbor gateway that we showed, um, and it's closed on the prediction of a storm and the storm doesn't come. Uh, it hasn't really, it hasn't affected the city at all. The, the inhabitants of the city will be unaware that the barrier closed. It will upset ship traffic for maybe a day. Uh, it might slow down somebody's deliveries coming from China, but um, it doesn't affect life in the city. As recently as August of 2020, when Hurricane Isaias was on its way north, some of the predictions showed it striking New York and causing flooding. As a result, a large number of temporary barriers were deployed, upland barriers, and really deployed in places where there was money, like Wall Street. So what you're seeing here are temporary barriers being deployed in Wall Street. And what you'll notice, a few things you'll notice, it takes a lot of people to do it, uh, and it blocks a lot of roadways. So in this instance, in preparation for a storm that did not hit, for flooding that would not have occurred. We took a lot of manpower, spent a lot of money, and uh, hobbled large portions of the city. This is a rendering taken from the Eastside Coastal Resilience Project, and it shows uh, the FDR drive gate crossing that was contemplated. This is similar to, I believe, what's uh, in the final drawings now. Uh, you'll notice these gates are large. They take a, a large number of people, perhaps trucks to close them. Um, they will be closed on the prediction of flooding. And once closed, the FDR drive is closed, which means no commuters, but it also means no ambulances, no police cars, no fire trucks. A major artery of the city has been closed down. Again, for a storm that may not come. The storm may come, the barriers may do what they were intended to do, uh, but the city's still closed once the storm retreats until those barriers are taken down again. So this ties back into what Dan was saying about the core needing to consider costs besides property damage. There's a cost of effectively closing the city down for a few days. This is a project I worked on that looked at putting floodgates across the Newtown Creek and uh, the Gowanus Canal to stop flooding from the East River. The, the, two, the two waterways are flooded badly during Sandy. Uh, and putting a gate across the openings to the canals is not enough because the water is happy to go around them until it hits high land. So you need return gates, gates that are perpendicular to the river, perpendicular to the, to the closure gate, uh, that go back as far as they need to to hit high land. Uh, they need to go somewhere. So this is one of the somewheres we looked at, looked uh, at a, a fairly wide industrial street in Brooklyn near the canal. Uh, you can pick any labels you want here uh, and, and figure out what the consequences are. But it's pretty clear if a large barrier goes down this street, those loading docks aren't going to work as they needed to work. Snow removal is not going to work terribly well, nor is trash collection, nor is light distribution. Uh, traffic won't work well. Um, so these barriers, unlike offshore barriers, um, are in the way of everyday life. I didn't know I was done that quickly, um, 
but pick your box and think about it. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Suzanne DiGeronimo to bring us in for a landing. Okay, so uh, we're gonna start with our slide of Superstorm Sandy, the extent. So this is the extent of Superstorm Sandy, um, the extent of the flooding. And uh, see the label where New York is in the lower tip of Manhattan? That small needle red line around Manhattan there, that's been the focus of most of the resiliency discussions. Now, you know what, Manhattan is certainly important and it's the economic engine of our region and some say of the East Coast, some say the world. And this is where Jonathan's pictures showed the process of installing that movable inflated barrier for Hurricane Isaias, uh, the storm that never came. Uh, and that inflatable barrier that Jonathan showed would protect only that small part of that small needle. Um, but how, so how can this whole uh, of these much, much larger red areas, all of these flooded areas be protected? Um, if you're just looking at solely land-based barriers, that's a huge cost. Uh, we members of the Storm Surge Working Group advocate for a layered defense. We're talking about low height walls at water's edge to protect from sea level rise, which as Malcolm has said, is the slow but insidious increase. He likens to maybe cholesterol buildup, eventually clogging arteries. And we also advocate for an outer harbor gate system to protect from storm surge. And Malcolm likens that to, of course, the tragic sudden heart attack. So let me take a minute here to review the process following Superstorm Sandy, or actually of any disaster that would come up. The state first, tries to solve its own problems. After three days, if the state can't, and if the federal government declares the event a federal disaster, FEMA comes in to save the day. So the feds provide resources and put people back in their homes. People are home, but really no better off in terms of being at risk for a repeated disaster, the next one to come, the years to come. But the process is worse than that. There's a second funding round that comes where FEMA comes in with HUD, Community Development Block Grants, and mitigates, elevates some, but not all homes above the flood design elevation. And those are on the stilts that you've all seen. Um, and uh, the cost is about $750,000 per home. I designed an elevation of some like 900 homes in Brooklyn and Staten Island and along the Jersey Shore. In Brooklyn, one home, in an entire block, a row of two-story attached homes, was only one home was authorized to be elevated. Uh, one home, one family protected. But I noticed that the region, the reason uh, the entire neighborhood flooded at all in the first place was that the water entered through a narrow inlet. Um, so the entire neighborhood and all the homes, all of the families could be protected if there were just one engineering work at that inlet. Seemed like a good idea to me. But because of the Stafford Act, FEMA can only spend mitigation money on structures actually damaged, not on creating new engineering works. So the next slide, Jonathan. The next slide is on our vulnerability of maritime and industrial areas. This slide shows um, all of the floodwaters uh, which damage property, yes, we, we all get that, but you, you know, let's not forget that floodwaters also enter industrial areas and pick up an environmental soup of toxic oil, gasoline, chemicals, sewage, and general hazards. And I don't know, preventing flooding in as much of the entire harbor as possible is a good idea in, in, in my book. And by the way, this map shows only New York City sites. It doesn't show the plethora of New Jersey sites that Sandy flooded both areas in New York and New Jersey. And both in New York and New Jersey are committed together. They signed that non-federal partnership uh, uh, with the federal government to, to do the study that Dan discussed. Uh, it's being accomplished by the Corps of Engineers. Dan mentioned those um, six options, five options under analysis. One was the placement of that outer, outer harbor gate system from Sandy Hook to Jamaica Bay. Uh, the other placements are protected less and less as you saw until the last one, uh, which was a no action scenario that protected nothing. But, but let's just talk for a moment about that big blank white area in New Jersey there. Uh, Hoboken received attention 
because it won one of those rebuild by design competitions and it envisioned a cl complex grouping of different types of mitigation methods. Um, those who lived in Hoboken through Sandy's 14 foot high flood walls clamored for mitigation. And then the residents heard that the program wanted to build 20 foot high walls at the water edge and they all protested. They didn't want the protection, they wanted their view. Jersey City is planning no protections, none. So do New Jersey homes and commercial structures and the whole back room support of industries uh, that, that New York needs, do these even deserve protection from flooding? Last year, 2020, um, uh, major national catastrophes caused insurance losses of 74 billion. In 2012, just one storm, Superstorm Sandy, logged 75 billion in damages. And our federal government paid 58 billion out of that. Now the court has creates a proportional calculation called a cost benefit analysis. And that's what Dan was talking about. The cost of the engineered work to value the property loss avoided. Uh, this cost benefit ratio is important because on the basis of this proportion, our New York, New Jersey, Outer Harbor Barrier or any solution we have here uh, is going to be ranked and judged against all of the structures that are on uh, Congress's uh, list all across the whole entire United States as having a better or worse expenditure of federal dollars cost to benefit. Now this slide here is environmental justice. The image on the left shows the extent of 1% probability of flood. At 1% probability over a 30 year mortgage term, a home in the blue highlighted areas will have a 26 chance of being flooded. That's one in four. The image on the right highlights the environmental justice areas. That means these areas are where all the low cost homes are in the public housing areas. This is where they all reside. One home selling for $14 million is valued at more and therefore ranked as having greater sway in the, in the calculations than 12 homes in the red areas valued at $250,000 each. Going back to Dan's circle of the four quadrants, um, there are other impacts to consider um, when engineering mitigation projects are under consideration, not just property values, which tend to favor the wealthy. The core currently has guidance only for the, to analyze the property values, as Dan pointed out. And uh, we have high hopes that, um, that new authorizations will be coming uh, to uh, allow these other areas to, to be um, analyzed as well. Also, the federal government subsidizes insurance for homes prone to flooding. For years, we have uh, avoided updating these insurance maps that you're seeing right here before you right now. Um, these communities in red, when they get flattened, we all pay for rebuilding them. So it's flood, flatten, rebuild, repeat. And so, you know, is it right for all of us Americans to pay the insurance claim to repair houses, let's say along the Mississippi River, that uh, where one house is flooded 14 times? On the other hand, just recently, the federal government thought about uh, revising the rates that, that uh, people would pay, which are currently set by government decree rather than market rate. If flood insurance were expensive, the theory goes, people would move and they wouldn't live there any longer. It'd be costly to build there. And the feds thought about raising the rates and then they decided no, that increasing rates would disproportionately impact the poor all in these red zones. So disaster assistance and subsidized flood insurance invite developers to reinvest in harm's way. Um, and investing in engineering works though would make the region more resilient. A 2021 study from the Bookings Institute found that the federal government spends about 46 billion per year on disaster recovery. And that is seven times the level of investing in resilience. Um, and resilience matters. You, you know what we have, there's tolls, there's fees, there's public private ventures that have federal money 
attached to them, airports, sewage authorities, rail yard, they all create through their uh, fees, tolls, and, and, and other uh, uh, funding sources, tens of trillions of dollars that are not based on income tax. Uh, adding to that, uh, proposed is an insurance surcharge to commercial flood policies of just 2%. And a 2% surcharge would create another pool of tens of trillions of dollars. So if we redirected how federal money combines with these uh, infrastructure enhancement funds uh, that are not tax-based to focus on resilience mitigation projects rather than simply rebuilding after disasters. But we all continue to go about our merry way, just like nothing has happened and flood zones. And that is until a disaster hits. But you know what? Here in New York and New Jersey, we, can, we just can't all run for the hills. I think we need to stand and fight. And so with that, we're going to conclude. And that we believe that flooding is a regional issue, that little progress has been made in protecting our region. There is little consensus of how to proceed. And we all need to be informed. Uh, and we are all responsible for ensuring that decisions that are made are based on strong science. And we do have some time for questions. And I think yeah. uh, maybe Eric, you're gonna lead this for us? Yeah, I'll take, I'll take it. Thank you, Suzanne. And thank you to the panel for a, a great discussion about where we can go and, and some of the big thoughts that need to go into where we're going. We have a couple of questions that come in. Uh, the first one actually comes from a speaker who was on our first panel uh, earlier in the series, Bill Amon, um, and he asked the question, um, this is going back to, I believe, uh, where, where uh, somebody else was talking about the, the, the modeling that was being done for some of this. It says, what happens with all the water that wants to flow down from the Hudson River, uh, question mark, since that presumably can't get out the harbor with the gates being closed, doesn't that start to back up and cause flooding? So I don't know who might want to take that uh, particular one, especially in regards, I think it's really in relation to the modeling question. That's Malcolm's favorite question. <laughs> I, I could answer this one as well. Of course, we've looked at this. Uh, so as long as we close the sea gates at low tide, you have basically five or six feet of uh, vertical capacity until you hit the high regular high tide mark. And so for Hurricane Sandy, for example, it modeled uh, sort of the 10 days following. Uh, anybody from the region will remember there was a bit of a freak snowstorm that came sort of a week later. Uh, but for Hurricane Sandy, it was actually a low rainfall event for the upper Hudson River and a lot of the catchment up there. And so we looked at that, just leaving, not, not just closing the gates for sort of, uh, sort of 12 hours or six hours the time of the landfall. We closed it for full 10 days. And because the outer New York Harbor and the uh, area of the Hudson River is so large that it only went up by six inches in that time. So it's a huge amount of capacity to absorb the incoming uh, rainfall and river water. But also you've got to consider large number of sewage treatment plants emptying into the region. And, uh, you know, if you keep close too long, you start impacting the, uh, the aquatic life. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Malcolm wants to speak any more on that or anybody else? If you're muted. Malcolm, you're muted. No, you're still Malcolm muted. Malcolm remains muted. <laughs> okay, here we go. There you go. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you, Hamish. The other point I mentioned earlier is that the Hudson River is very flat. It's like a 140 mile canal all the way up to Troy, uh, with a, where there's a dam, a federal dam. So it can store a huge amount of water. Um, even though the, and even if we had a high precipitation event, Hamish said it was, uh, Sandy was a low precipitation, there is, the calculations show that it is not a problem. And as Hamish pointed out, the gates are closed at low tide. So you've already got six feet below the normal high tide. So it is, that is not a problem. All right, well, thank you gentlemen for that. Um, the next question uh, comes, relates to the barriers themselves. And I think it's an interesting question. What are the types of floodgates slash barriers that have been found best suited for this kind of, this proposal? 
And then also what would be the environmental impact of these structures, especially with respect to aquatic life and natural shoreline stabilization medium. So kind of taking a little bit off what you were just talking about, Malcolm and, and Hamish. So I don't know who'd like to take that. I think Jonathan should speak to that. I'm happy to take the first crack. So the, the, um, the best floodgates and barriers for, for this proposal, um, it's actually a number of barriers we're looking at. So uh, for the Ambrose Channel, which is a very, very wide channel, we would have to use something like a sector gate, which would be what was shown in that animation. It was like the Mason barrier in Holland. It's like the St. Petersburg barrier. These very, very large gates that, can, that uh, are pushed out and float until they're sunk, and they can be used for very large channels. Now, in the overall concept that that animation was taken from, there were some smaller channels on the side, and those were able to use things like drop gates because, and lift gates because they were for, for much smaller vessels. So the, the, um, the types of barriers go with the width of the barrier, the depth of the water, uh, and, and what's needed for the channel. Um, the second part of the question about the environmental impact, we've done an awful lot of modeling um, on, the, on the coastal dynamics, on the river dynamics, on the ocean dynamics, because we have access to Hamish and Keith who have access to an awful lot of computing power to do that. We need at least as much computing power to see what the uh, impacts are gonna be on aquatic life and, and natural shorelines. Uh, what we do know is this, and it comes back to the 1779 chart that Malcolm showed, is that we have been changing the harbor for over 200 years now. And we, we did a quick calculation of uh, the, the fact that a gate, even when it's open, does impede the flow of water. And we compared that to what the flow of water would have been like uh, in the 18th century before we started dredging and dredging and dredging. So the average depth of the harbor was probably about 30 feet before we started dredging. We now have 50 foot channels going down uh, the middle of our harbor. So the flow of water actually would probably still be more than it was before we started messing with the harbor. Uh, this group is well aware that we're gonna be changing, that if, if barriers go in, there will be changes to the environment, there'll be changes to the flow, there'll be changes to the salt wedge that moves up and down the Hudson. Uh, and those have to be studied very, very well. Thank you, Jonathan, for that. Um, let me move on to another question. We've got a couple more questions still left, and I, and I do want to see if we can get to as many as we can here. Uh, this is actually coming out of the chat. Ken Avery asks, uh, how do you assign the joint probabilities of a hurricane on the interior drainage basins that include the Hudson, the Passaic, and others? I don't know if we would like to take that question. Is that the same similar question that we answered when we uh, talked about the storage capacity? I th think about the storage capacity of Hudson maybe a little bit, but I think he's also thinking about other other waterways. A joint probability, I only heard one thing, of hurricanes and what? Yeah, I, I don't know quite what he's- Interior drainage. Interior drainage, oh, oh, yes. he's comparing hurricane to interior drainage. Yeah. In so question. Our, our model, uh, we are looking really from the ocean up to sort of the five, six meter uh, contour on land. Uh, we're not we're not trying to do overland overland flooding from rivers. Uh, that's more sort of the domain of the USGS. Uh, those models exist, and they can be coupled with these flooding models, and other people do that. But in our particular model, we're Sort of looking at flooding from the, from the inside out. And we can include river inputs where we have it. There's not that many river gauges around the place. And you can, I guess, look at the rainfall and catchment and say that volume of water eventually has to end up in, in the river. Uh, I guess the only other thing I'd add to that is that the hurricanes, if we're looking at hurricanes and not like winter nor Easter, Hurricane travels very quickly and passes over the area in a few hours. And whereas it may take uh, you know, half a day or more for all the rainfall and all the catchments to work their way down the tributaries to the main river. And so the peak of the flooding from the river may happen long after sort of the 15 feet of storm surge is long gone. 
And so they don't, nat they don't naturally add on to each other. All right, great. Well, thank you for that. Well, uh, does anybody else have any other thoughts on that particular question? All right, the last question well, then, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, 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 I, I had a, a, a sort of a separate point to make about um, the exposure to the open ocean that may be different from other other countries responsible. I'll hold that till I hear your question. Yeah, so the last question is, uh, and I think you in part answered it through your presentation. Um, did you include a non-structural alternative as suggested by the Army Corps of Engineers or was anything suggested by them? Uh, that's the last question we had come in. I think Jonathan, you can answer that one well. Uh, I'll, I'll answer that. Or, or Dan, yep. Yeah. Uh, the Corps, did not have a non-structural alternative uh, uh, up to now. And I think the, uh, this recently uh, adopted Water Resources Development Act in uh, last December uh, requires them to include one. So uh, they will have to include it. It hasn't been included up to now. I'd like to pile on a bit if I can. Um, because this harkens back to the, the very early days after Sandy, when uh, the city in particular was doing an awful lot of outreach, trying to get ideas, and there was rebuild by design about how can, what are some innovative ideas to stop flooding. And there was a lot of talk about, about natural non-structural solutions, a lot of it driven by what happened in Katrina. And one of the lessons learned by Katrina is Katrina was made far worse because of the miles and miles and miles of marshland that had been destroyed over the, over the years. And that had that marshland been there, it would have reduced the energy of the, of the incoming water and therefore reduced the flooding. So there's a real interest here in doing things like oyster beds, doing things like sponge parks um, and, and such, which are wonderful, wonderful ideas. Uh, but we need to remember what it is we're trying to solve with storm surge. And we're trying to solve uh, what to do with water coming in that's 10 or 15 feet high. Um, and the oyster beds and sponge parks uh, and, and seagrass and such are wonderful environmental positives, but they don't address storm surge. So um, I'm not sure what the Corps is gonna do for non-structural alternatives given what the input is. Great. Well, thank you, uh, folks, for answering those. The last of the questions that have come in. I think, however, Suzanne, we have a few questions for the audience that they need to be able to answer to be able to make sure they've done the right thing here. Is that correct? That's it. That's it. We have some questions that Jonathan's going to put up. And uh, Eric asked me not to read them because he said everybody can read. Yeah, and, and, so, and if, you, if you'd like to uh, put your answer in the chat as we go along, and we'll know that you are A here. And B, you know the answer or don't know the answer. And we'll reveal it to you once a couple of things. So as we're going through here, uh, this is a true or false question. So just go ahead and put true or false in the chat. We go along. Um, there is a hand raise uh, by one of the attendees. Um, but we may come back to that here at the end. Um, so do you want to go through all of this? Because we, we uh, yep. the next slide shows the answer. Yep, yep. So we'll just give a second here. People are answering in the chat. So far, I don't see people having a struggle deciding whether it's true or false. We'll see if they get it all correct though when we do the big reveal here in a moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like we've getting people in here. So if we're ready, I think let's go ahead and reveal. And if you wanna explain some on this, Suzanne, whoever uh, wrote Sure, it's a storm surge at high tide will reach a higher elevation than the storm surge at low tide, right? So for all those that answered true, you are correct. That was everybody in the chat. Uh, those that didn't answer, you didn't, nothing ventured, nothing gained. So uh, <laughs> we, we need you to make sure you're getting in there. So next question, if you would. So again, uh, true or false? Give you a couple of moments. A lot of people making a decision. That's good. Okay, yep, we're getting them in here. That's good. So I think we can, uh, I think we're at the point we got a number in here, but go ahead and let's do a reveal. And then who would like to kind of explain this? 
Well, we have a 14 foot high surge produced by Sandy and it exceeds most of the long-term projections of sea level rise for the metropolitan area. So if you answered true, you were correct. Uh, again, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Those had, nobody had false. So we're, we're, we're going, going good so far. We were, you know, everybody's winning Jeopardy here. I guess you could be the next guest host on Jeopardy if these were the questions. So okay. that's good. All right, go for it, Eric. I love it. Okay, true so false. true or false. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, we've got some some we've got some contention here. We have some falses, some trues. We'll see what the right answer is here at the big reveal. All right, all right. And the answer is yes, true. So, uh, so Malcolm does a wonderful job of explaining this. <laughs> well, we never talked about tsunami, but tsunami is caused by an offshore undersea earthquake. And it lifts up the sea floor, which creates this huge wave, which can, as we've seen disasters uh, in other parts of the world can do catastrophic damage. We are not considering tsunami. Tsunami would be exceedingly rare in the Atlantic Ocean, more common in the Pacific Ocean because of the volcanic activity, but certainly tsunami could overwhelm even storm surge barriers if we got a huge one. Um, so they do actually uh, cause coastal flooding, but we're, co we're focused on the storm surges, which is the wind blowing on the seas, creating huge waves and pushing the water against the coast. Great, thank you. Next question. Trust me, there's only a couple more, so feel free. True or false? Well, tsunami um, cannot be predicted days in advance because they travel very rapidly. They travel at over we, we haven't got everybody's answer yet, Malcolm. Oh, so let's oh, not explain. Oh, let's not give away the answer until everybody's had a chance to answer the question. The student, it's not like the professor of you to, to give everybody the answer to the sorry. test during the test. I'm sorry. Everything I said was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think uh, I think we've given the reveal. Let's go ahead and reveal the answer here. <clears throat> Next click. There you go. So as you were saying, Malcolm. <laughs> right. Tsunami will travel a wave at 450 miles an hour. So uh, it, would, it will arrive very rapidly, even from the other side of the Atlantic. Um, it, you may get 10 hours warning, but that's it. But yeah. storm surges, we can predict now with our Stony Brook uh, computing systems three days or more ahead of time. Great. Well, thank you. Next question. This is not true or false. You have to choose a letter here, A through E. So take a quick look at the question and put your answer in the chat. Studying the question carefully. It's good. Everybody's studying the question carefully. We don't have any takers on the answer yet. Oh, we got a couple coming in now. Were they paying attention to the presentation? That is the question on this question. Outstanding. So getting a few more answers in. So everybody's getting an answer. That's good. All right, let's do the big reveal. Now one person has a different answer. It's good. All right, so who'd like to explain this? Maybe Hamish? Hamish, hey, you're on mute, Hamish. Yeah, the Keith, Keith's chair, this is his specialty. Okay, Keith? <laughs> yes. Sir. Sure, yeah, the, the answer to that question is E. Uh, unstructured grids, one of the major advantages of them is that they can provide access, uh, They provide a uh, resolution only where you need it. So, and at the same time that eliminates the need to have a nesting type approach where you have to have different grids in different areas and have them communicate between each other. And at the same time, it also allows us to uh, save on, on computational resources, facilitating this kind of regional modeling type approach. Great. And I think this is our last question, if I'm correct. The last true one. True or false. So get your answer in now while you can. True or false. Get 
getting mixed answers from the audience. <clears throat> All right, Let's see if there's any last takers, a couple last takers, great. Let's go ahead and reveal the answer and who wants to explain this one? Malcolm does a beautiful job too on this one. Well, it's, it's interesting, uh, the 100 year uh, storm damage a building code has been deep, deeply embedded in the culture of New York City and maybe other regions in the, in the United States for, for a long, long time, but it's obviously proving not to be adequate. But if you look at the, in fact, the, the, the station, the, 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 the uh, South Ferry Station on the number one subway line, the pride of New York City when it was rebuilt for, at a cost of $640 million, I remember asking the chief engineer Un, down inside this new station before it was built, you know, what, the, it seems very close to the entrance, seems very close to sea level. And he said to me, No, no, Mr. Bowman, it's, uh, it's designed to protect against the 100 year storm. And I said, Well, Mr. Chief Engineer, the 100 storm means it could happen next week, even. He said, No, 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 we're good for 100 years. Well, Sandy s destroyed that station. If you go, if you look at the Dutch, the Dutch, protect their coastline. For them, it's a question of national survival. They don't screw around. I mean, they build their barriers to a one in a thousand year storm level, which means 0.1% probability each year, and even 10,000 years. Now you might say, how on earth could you do that? But the difference between a 1,000 and a 10,000 year event is not that different actually, but so they've got nowhere to run. As, as um, Suzanne said, the, the running for the hills, there are no hills for the Dutch to run to and surrounding countries of France and Belgium and, and um, Germany don't want 20 million Dutch refugees. So the 100 year storm standard is woefully inadequate in this era of climate change and will get worse as time goes by. Thank you, Malcolm. Suzanne, do you have any final things to wrap us up here? Uh, no, but we're really uh, very uh, thankful and, and uh, grateful that uh, for all of the people who attended the session. And um, um, thank you all for, for listening and uh, go out and become a, an advocate for uh, our storm surge barrier. And a reminder also that there is, again, on October 6th, there is a save the date uh, for uh, already out for our uh, Resiliency Mini Summit. We'll be revisiting this topic uh, actually very specifically during that uh, summit on the 6th of October. So please join us for that. And please all have a great, wonderful and resilient day. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.